yes yes sure huh? yes sir yes sir there some technical problems i think yes and yes yes um, i'll always be there yeah yeah okay 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 Sir, we are going to start, sir. Now. Uh, it is a glorious moment to extend my warm good morning to all of you, making an impactful presence in the healthcare scenario of Mangalore. Mangala Charitable Trust is the advanced hospital of Coastal Karnataka, established in the year 1998 by Dr. Ganapati P. as Mangala Nursing Home. In the year 1998, Mangala Kidney Foundation came into existence. Later, in the year 2000, Mangala Charitable Trust and Hemodialysis was established. During his service to provide best health care in Mangalore, in the year 2006, Mangala School of Nursing, and in the year 2012, Mangala College of New Mangala College of Nursing was established under the banner of Mangala Charitable Trust. Plus general nursing and midwifery course, as well as basic BSc nursing course, affiliated to Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, Bangalore, with all the necessary affiliations. It's indeed a great pleasure to stand before you on behalf of the management, staff, and students of Mangalam Group of Education Institutions to extend a warm welcome to one and all. We are lucky to have a person with foundation, head of the innumerated ideas, an idol of knowledge, experience, and inspiration to all of us. Our beloved chairman, Dr. Ganapati P. With the due respect, pride, and honor, I welcome you, sir. The wind and the waves are always on the side of the ablest navigator. Our beloved vice chairman, Dr. Anita G. Bhatt. Happy welcome to you, ma'am. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome Mr. Rajesh Mali, trustee and secretary of Mangala Hospital and Mangala Group of Education Institution. I welcome you, sir. Today, we have with us dynamic and eminent resource personalities, Dr. Colonel A. T. K. Rao, pediatric hematologist, oncologist. Professor and head of the Department of Pediatrics since Bangalore, and Dr. Ashoka Satish, Assistant Professor, Department of Childbirth Nursing, Manipal College of Nursing, Mayi Manipal. A warm welcome to both of you. We are lucky to have motivating and inspiring personalities. Seeing. Mrs. Pratijna Swarsini, Mangala Group of Educational Institutions. Dr. Bharat Bharat, Principal, Mangala Physiotherapy College. Vice Principal, Mrs. Malathi, Mrs. Han, and Mrs. Geeta Lakshmi. I feel highly privileged to welcome you all. I'm glad to welcome yes. Mr. Dharmara, Principal oh. Officer, and Student Welfare Officer. I welcome you, sir. I I feel proud to welcome Mr. Vijesh Piaro. His great efforts went in preparing for this day. I welcome you, sir. Obviously, it goes without saying the great efforts of my dear colleagues preparing for this day. Careful inspection of every detail, as in slightest carelessness, 
can spoil the entire effort. The preparation could not happen overnight. My lovely welcome goes to you all. My hearty welcome goes to all fourth year BSc nursing students who have worked hard day and night for the success of this webinar. I welcome you all. Finally, I welcome you all, dear delegates. A lovely morning on your way. Reach this day with your beautiful smile. I wish you all a great day. Once again, I welcome all of you. Hello, sir. Hello, moderate. Moderate. Number six. A cordial welcome to Philip Speakers and all the delegates. I, Mr. Sonam Chokgen, fourth year based nursing student, humbly takes this opportunity to give an open arm reception for today's first session on topic parental concern and management guidance. I repeat, parental concern and management guidance. I quote, if your action inspires others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. I am taught by John Eden. It is my honor to introduce one of the influential, dedicated, passionate, noble, and down-to-earth leader, Dr. Colonel H.K. Rao, as our first resource person. Dr. H.K. Rao is an ex-army personnel, and once you become fearless, life becomes limitless. And we are much obliged to have you, sir. Sir accomplished his Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery in Armed Force Medical College at Pune. Later, he pursued his MD in Pediatrics and continued his specialty training in Pediatrics, Hematology, and Oncology in Children's Hospital at Birmingham, United Kingdom. Later, he tracked his diploma in Hospital man Management from National Institute of Health and Family Welfare at Delhi. He served as faculty member in Pediatrics in Pediatric Hematology, Oncology in Armed Forces and Medical College, Teaching Hospital of Indian Armed Forces and Kasaba Medical College, Manipur University, at MS Ramaya Medical College, Principal and Dean in MBJ College at Bengaluru. His prestigious and prosperous privileges were as Colonel in Indian Army Corps, as expert committee member of Joint Indian Council of Medical Research Indian Council of and Research Indian Council of Agriculture Research Task Force on Pesticides and Human Health. As a member of expert monitoring committee under government of India for Clean Ganga Project 2015, Indian Council of Medical Research expert referee of multi-center national protocol for the management of childhood leukemia. As executive board member of Eastern of the Pediatric Oncology Group of Eastern and Mediterranean Country. As formal chairperson of hematology and oncology between year 2012 and 2014, and DM and FMB examiner in pediatric hematology and oncology. Currently, sir is serving as a senior professor in pediatrics at Sapagiri Institute of Medic Medical Sciences, Bangalore. And we are 
pleased and delighted to have elegant, eminent, and venerable speaker in today's session. And I request respected delegates to participate attentively and mute your audio and drop your queries in chat box for caution and association. Now it's over to you, sir. <clears throat> Hello, thank you, Ajit. Can you hear me? Hello, yes, am sir. I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Ajit, for a wonderful introduction. And uh, I'd like to start the session by showing you today's Times of India paper. And uh, I, I hope you can read what is written there. And that it's mentioned that only 0.3% of 35 lakh children screen had COVID in Karnataka. So, and, and very appropriately, uh, just a little on the side, if you can see here, it is written that India is the biggest COVID misinformation source in the world. So my talk today is going to try and reduce the panic with which parents are uh, encountering and are displaying for this illness, as well as try and remove all the misinformation, which has been going around all over the world, but lots of it from India. So before I go any further, I would like to share my screen with you. And this is the presentation I would like to uh, share. Yes. Okay, so uh, the talk today is on COVID-19 in children, parental concerns and management guidelines. Um, I would like to start by asking, uh, this is a question answer session. So uh, I would be very happy to receive uh, questions from you at the end of the session. Uh, the most important uh, question which we are opening now is what is COVID-19? And for that, the answer is it's a coronavirus infection. Coronavirus remains in the environment in under four strains, the A, B, C, and D, they are mainly uh, viruses of animals. A and B seen, uh, uh, strains are seen in cats and dogs. And of course, in other mammals, warm-blooded animals like bats, etc. Since 2019, September 2019, there was an antigenic shift as a result of which this virus began to affect human beings. And that is with disastrous consequences, as we all know. The illness actually began in September 2019, and it infects humans in waves by mutating rapidly. Even the first wave which we had last year was because of a, a specific mutation in the virus, which then allowed it to attach onto human cells. And subsequently, you all know that there are many variants. Hello. Uh, there are many variants. Each mutation is a means to ensure virus survival. The, the virus is just doing its job. It's not doing anything great, right? It's, and the job of the virus is to survive. And how does it survive? Because the host, that is the human beings, the human beings, the, the host, is. It, you find it difficult for the host to mount an attack. If the host mounts an attack on the virus, the virus mutates and uh, tries to ensure its own survival. Basically, the virus attaches to the endothelial cell in the blood vessels all over the body. And therefore, it is capable of affecting each and every organ in the body. It is associated with significant mortality. It is with very significant mortality, as we all know, especially in the second wave. But let me assure you that there are many more dangerous viruses in this world, like Ebola and Hunter viruses, which have a significantly higher level of mortality than this one virus. And unfortunately, till date, there is no specific treatment for the coronavirus. There have been many, many, many uh, therapies tried out. Some of them have worked, some of them have not worked. But as such, there is no scientific evidence to point to a cure for any one problem to ameliorate the virus. And most of the deaths occur due to complication of the infection. So I need you to understand this about coronavirus. We'll go to the next slide. 
before i go any further i want to tell you about the limit, limitations of this presentation please understand that this is a very young disease it's barely 18 to 20 months old it's the first time it has come across uh, uh, human beings and it's the first time that human beings have come across this virus right now it is only 18 months old data is still still pouring in from all corners of the globe and opinions are changing by the minute you need to understand that the 2021 sars cov2 virus that is the delta variant and other variants is behaving totally differently from the 2020 virus therefore to get a comprehensive picture of this virus and its illness you have to use what is called as meta analysis by screening a large number of data which is coming in from all over so i have done that for the last 18 months and have screened all the information so all this information if whatever i'm going to give you on the presentation today is available on the net unfortunately many studies are still incomplete we have received the preliminary data but we don't know the final data as yet so there may be changes in the final data and finally as far as scientific data for delta plus and other variants is concerned we are still we still await this data to us so i'm going to divide this into part 1 and part 2 part 1 is parental concerns and parental concerns include 10 different questions which i'm sure parents would like to ask about this illness so let's not waste any more time i'm going on to the first question and the first question is can children get covid-19 infection and the answer is a unequivocal yes they can the youngest patient recorded was a newborn day 3 of life but any age can be affected the severe the severity of the illness depends on the innate immunity of the patient right so if the per person has excellent immunity he gets maybe an asymptomatic he doesn't even doesn't even know that he has got the coronavirus whereas if they have low immunity the disease can spread also if there is hyper immunity you can have a cytokine storm and you can have other manifestations of the disease so just open pray that you've got just enough immunity to to counter this disease question number 2 how can i prevent my child from getting the infection you know right now there are a lot of lot of uh, you know home remedies suggested to boost infection to be, uh, sorry to boost immunity to boost uh, the general uh, well being of the child to boost it malnutrition well you know there are many many such available i want you to understand clearly that none of them have got a scientific basis immunity is innate it depends on your body and it is immunity is uh, brought out by the lymphocytes and the, there are two types of lymphocytes the t lymphocyte and the b lymphocyte the t lymphocyte is the one which identifies the the antigen or the virus and the b lymphocyte is the one which mounts the challenge till date there have been no medications or therapies which can boost either of them which can boost either of these two cells so spending money on immunity boosters and etc etc uh, may be actually a waste of time and money however i would like to add that a good nutrition is essential because there are so many things in good nutrition like trace elements zinc etc which are all required to fight infection so other than taking immunity boosters and giving your child immunity boosters i need you to ensure that the child gets a good adequate wholesome diet and plenty of mental and physical exercise right these are the probably the important thing but of course i want to tell you the other facts also and that includes maintaining physical distancing and staying at home as far as possible to wear a proper mask when outside the house to wash hands and arms frequently to vaccinate all eligible persons in the household and vicinity of the child avoid crowds and public gatherings and parents would do a great favor to their children if they explain what is covid appropriate behavior to the children and why it must be done uh, you know by just telling the child that you must wear a mask or you must social distance the child is not going to accept what you have to explain to the child what exactly is the problem and how this is going to help get over that problem so that is very important question number 3 what about vaccines for children i'm sure many of you would have this idea till date no vaccine has been authorized for anybody less than 18 years of age but i can assure
for children below 18 years of age. We expect the child vaccine to be available in India. The data is being finalized and we expect the vaccine to come within the next three months. So please be patient. You, one cannot use the adult vaccines on the child at present till we get the safety data of these vaccines back in public. Question four, my child has fever. How can I tell if it is COVID-19 or not? Now, this is a little tricky. It is difficult to say categorically whether your child has COVID-19 or not. But please understand that COVID-19 is another viral infection. So we treat all children with fever and cough as having viral fever. And we observe them for the first three days. We give them some paracetamol and some antihistaminic, some nasal drops, and we observe for three days. After three days, if the baby worsens, then we advise the COVID test, especially if there is a history of contact with, with a, another person or a household where there was COVID-19. And anyway, you can afford to wait for these three days because the COVID test come positive only between day two and day three and become fully established after day three. So normally also, we would not like to do the COVID test very early in the illness because you may get false negative in these uh, children. And then it, it totally you know, confuses the treating uh, doctor whether to treat for uh, COVID-19 or not. So please understand, three days, wait for three days till the fever gets over. over. If the, in three days, if the fever comes down, forget about it. It's just another viral illness. If after three days also the child is symptomatic or he's become worse, or anything like that, immediately get the test done and take the necessary precautions. Question number five, how does COVID-19 affect children? This is an important uh, aspect of the illness. Please understand a majority of the children are asymptomatic. Majority, I'm talking about 90% here. Most of the rest get only mild disease. And this mild disease manifests as cough, cold, mild fever off and on, lasts for three days, and subsides by itself. A and B, that is asymptomatic children and mild disease children constitute about 95% of all COVID-19 infections in any country, in any population. Of the other 5%, there are problems. These children may require hospitalization or require ICU care. The organs can be involved. They can be heart complications. They can be lung complications. They can be liver complications. They can be kidney complications, they can be brain complications, they can be blood complications. And we have two syndromes quite typical in children. One is called the MISC, that is multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And the other is long COVID. All of this can happen in that remaining 5%. Please understand that the number of children who get this kind of problems, who require ICU care, who require, uh, you know, close monitoring and treatment is only 1% to 2% of symptomatic children. So you can well imagine how less. That is exactly why I held up this paper and showed you this. It's only 0.3% of 35 lakh children who tested positive for COVID. So the, the number is very small. We have a huge number of viruses in the environment. Any one of them can cause uh, the, tip, the symptoms typical of COVID-19. So please do not panic. Please do not panic. The chances of your child getting COVID-19 is very, very less unless an adult has got the COVID-19 in the family or in the vicinity. Question number six. Which child is more at risk of getting severe COVID disease? This is an important, interesting question. And this is something which I would like to tell the parents about the child. And that is those with significant pre-existing diseases like congenital heart disease, or kidney or liver diseases or malignancies or those on steroids and immunosuppressants. What do I mean by immunosuppressants? Like chemotherapy, uh, a long, long duration steroid use. These children are definitely more prone to get severe COVID disease because all of these diseases reduce the innate immunity. It reduces the T cell and the B lymphocyte function. Children with obesity, diabetes, asthma, or a chronic lung problem may also be at slightly higher risk. We had two papers which had come out from Europe, one from Italy and one from England, which said that children with obesity, diabetes, and asthma had a slightly higher uh, rate of infection and highly, slightly higher rate of hospitalization among all the children studied. Uh, we are still awaiting further data on this. 
but in the meanwhile it may be it may be wise to keep these children strictly under surveillance question number 7 do all children with severe disease require icu care this is something which i need to uh, you know this will help reduce the panic no all children will not require icu care what we need is monitoring so monitoring cannot really be done well at home so those children with severe diseases it is better to admit them to hospital at least somebody will be seeing them all the time there the parents the nurses the attending physicians and we usually put these children in the covid ward on what is called as a pulse oximeter and we monitor their saturation and the pulse and the heart rate and blood pressure quite regularly again i need to stress here is that 95% of these children admitted for observation recover from the illness and go home and go home to attend school after that so please understand it's a very minuscule proportion of children who will require icu care and who will you know progress to get life threatening disease i again request all the parents not to panic not to panic this is not a time for you to panic by panicking you will create more problems for your child putting unnecessary pressure on the medical systems next question there is a, a feeling among many of our parents and many of the population that children are super spreaders of the disease so they should not meet any of the elderly people in the house you keep the elderly grandparents away you bring the children and keep them in one place and you separate the grandparents and the children well that had some kind of basis earlier when a lot of children are found to be negative but now the recent data which is coming in says that this is a myth in fact children spread the disease much less than adults and i would like to give you a reference of this this is the unicef latest 2021 report on covid in children i would very much like you to go through this report unicef is the one which has given me this reference so i would like you to understand that children spread the disease much less than adults right now we'll go ahead to question number question number 9 are covid positive asymptomatic and covid positive in the house if there is an outbreak of or cluster in the school it may be wiser to get it done and the third is if the child has a fever cough and cold of more than 3 days duration that would be the ideal time testing the answer is not really if the child is asymptomatic parents can afford to wait you have to wait but for a minimum of 14 days uh, the government of india says that you have to be in strict home quarantine for 10 days and after that for 7 days in home quarantine inside the house a total of 17 days but most of the literature from abroad says that a 14 day quarantine period is more than enough so by and large if you want to keep and the child under observation in case somebody else in the family or in the vicinity has got covid 19 has tested covid 19 positive and you do not want to get that test done then you have to keep that child under home quarantine for 14 days and observe carefully and then in the middle if the child does become symptomatic you could always get the test done in the middle or after 3 days of fever whatever is earlier so these are the questions which i would like to share with the parents and again i would like to tell them that there is no need for panic the next part of this talk will be on newborn care covid 19 in the newborn baby and this is something which many of the young mothers and uh, who are looking after the neonates would like to know and again all this information is from various guidelines and various uh, literature which we have been getting over the last 18 months so number one question is does sars cov2 that is the covid virus does it cross the placenta and the answer is there is a limited information as of june 2021 there have been reports which say the transmission of sars cov2 through the placenta more so with the 2021 variant is likely 
in 0 to 8 percent and possibly more so in situations with significant predisposing factors in the mother. I would like to tell you what are the significant predisposing factors in the mother. Number one is the viral load in the mother. If the mother is symptomatic, if the mother is symptomatic with COVID-19, there is more chance that she may uh, transmit this uh, virus to her newborn. Second is immune status of the mother. If the mother is already compromised with liver, kidney disease, or uh, you know uh, any of the other kind of diseases, and the baby is preterm, because you must understand that preterm babies are severely immune, immunologically compromised. So if in either of these two situations, the chance of the, the virus crossing the placenta is very much more. And finally, especially if the mother gets the infection in the third trimester, as compared to the other two trimesters. So the, the significant predisposing factors in pregnancy is viral load of the mother, immune status of the mother and or baby and onset of infection in the third trimester versus other trimesters. So these are the things which can definitely cause the virus to transmit into the baby. Second cause, does SARS-CoV-2 affect the new one? This is something which we need to answer. And the concerns of opinion is that the 2021 virus seems to be more invasive than the original. In 2020, when the illness just came about, we had only two papers from China which said that there was a transmission of the virus into the baby and the baby was symptomatic. But in 2021, we've got a huge number of papers which have said that the newborn has been symptomatic. If you remember, the first slide I'd shown that the, the baby which was the youngest baby recorded to be infected with COVID-19 uh, and getting the symptoms of the disease was a three-day-old neonate. So the 2021 virus seems to be a little more invasive in this aspect as compared to the 2020 variant. There is a changing pattern of organ system involvement in the predisposed neonate, which is being seen, which is being noted serially. And today we have something called the MISC, a cytokine mediated uh, multi uh, system inflammatory syndrome in children, which is for the first time being reported in the 2021 variant, the Delta variant. So, in that aspect, the Delta variant appears to be a little more invasive and a little more dangerous than the 2020 variant, as far as newborns are concerned. Placental involvement. See, this is something which is a little worrying. If you remember, there was a, there was a, a virus in Brazil called Zika virus, and that caused uh, children to be born with small heads and with severe mental retardation. This is the problem which we need to work out because there have been reports which are coming in, especially from the United States and from Britain, that placental involvement in the third trimester of pregnancy with mothers who have COVID-19, the placental involvement may lead to delayed or chronic effects on further growth and development of the newborn. So this is something which we are a little concerned about even at the present, because when this placenta is involved, it can cause placental and fetal thrombosis. And once there is thrombosis, there is deficiency or decrease in the supply of blood to the growing fetus, right? So this is something which we need to be a little concerned about, right? Next question. Can maternal COVID infection cause congenital abnormalities in the newborn? I mean like this, cleft lip, cleft palate, all of this, can it happen? And the answer is, there is currently very limited data regarding an increased risk of miscarriage or early pregnancy loss in relation to COVID-19. That means, however, there is still very little clear-cut evidence that the virus can cause these congenital malformations. But as I'm again and again repeatedly telling you, the data in this aspect is very scanty. We are still getting reports that an odd case here and there, the baby was mutagenic. Please understand, for this problem to happen, the mother should get the infection in the first trimester of pregnancy. Why? Because the first trimester of pregnancy is where the baby's organs are being formed. The baby's organs and uh, tissues are being formed. So only if the mother gets the infection in the first trimester will it cause this problem. Again, the data is very scanty. It may not happen. And long-term data is awaited, especially with reference to the Delta variant disease. But I need to tell you very clearly that presently COVID-19 infection is currently not, repeat, not an indication for medical termination of pregnancy. 
as advised by the WHO in April 2021. Am I clear about this? I hope I'm very clear. It is not an indication for MTP. Right, next. Does the baby of a COVID positive mother have to be isolated at birth? Right, does it have to be isolated at birth? And the consensus of opinion is, the ICMR guidelines of 2021 says not necessary to isolate the baby, only single precautions to limit contact with maternal secretions. Okay, simple precaution to limit contact with maternal secretions. The WHO guidelines also say the same thing, wear a mask, wash hands and breasts before each feed, keep other people far away. No, there, and there is certainly no additional benefit in isolating the baby. The American Academy of Pediatrics consensus statement in 2021 says, if the mother is seriously ill with COVID and requires help in caring for the baby, then the baby may be isolated in the nursery and provided care, but can be uh, provided care. But when in the nursery, when the, this baby is being cared for, all precautions, COVID appropriate precautions need to be taken in the, in the nursery. Otherwise, the other children may get infected with an infected baby. Right. Next question. Does the virus appear in breast milk? This is a very important question and we need to understand why this happened. And the consensus of the statement is the COVID nucleic acid, the genome has been detected in the breast milk. It has been detected. But, but a viable infectious virus has not yet been detected. So the genetic material of the virus has been found in breast milk. But the virus itself, the whole virus, which is capable of causing infection, has not been detected as yet, as yet in the breast milk. Anti-COVID IgA antibodies have been detected in the breast milk of positive mothers. What is the simply significance? This is an excellent mechanism of protecting the baby. Once you get IgA antibodies, even if the live virus comes into the breast milk, it will be neutralized by these. IgA antibodies. So this is very, very important for us to know. And therefore, WHO says, WHO says, pasteurization of milk can inactivate SARS-CoV-2. This is especially true for when you are keeping breast milk from a breast milk bank, etc. And therefore, WHO says, clearly because of these reasons, breastfeeding should continue. You should not stop the breastfeeding for these babies, for this particular reason. If at a later date, we get information and data which says that it is dangerous and hazardous, definitely we will advise our uh, staff not to allow the baby to breastfeed. But till of date, there is no bar. Please do not stop the baby from breastfeeding. The benefits of breastfeeding far, far, far outweigh the deleterious side effects of breast milk if there are any. We still don't know if there are any deleterious side effects. Right. Next question. What are the symptoms of COVID positive, uh, or symptoms of the disease in a COVID positive infant? And this I would like to say is like any other, any other viral infection. There could be cough, there could be respiratory distress, there could be poor feeding, there could be diarrhea. Uh, baby may present with, with convulsions, they can have lethargy and irritability, and they have a Quite a typical skin rash, which I want to show to you. This is one of the skin rashes which you are talking about. It looks like a morbiliform rash. In the newborn, it looks like as if the newborn has got measles, which is not, measles does not occur in newborns, right? It occurs much later. Why? Because the maternal antibodies protect against measles up to nine months of age. That's why we give the vaccination for measles at nine months of age. But if a newborn which has this kind of rash, which looks like measles. You look at it and say, good God, this baby has got measles, but it's a newborn, right? That's the time when you have to be a little careful. It could be COVID. And the second kind of skin rash, it looks like this. It's blotchy red rashes all over the back on the neonate. Both of this can indicate, can indicate that this is COVID-19, right? Okay. The other is, you have to understand the presentation is different in early onset versus late onset disease. In early onset disease, it may present as sepsis. Many of us who treat children in the neo neonatal intensive care have the problem that the baby has developed an infection which has led to septicemia. COVID-19 can cause septicemia in newborns, but in late onset disease, once the baby's immune mechanism has started working against the 
virus, you find that these babies are very much more, uh, what you call, able to handle the disease and they are very much less sick. So late onset COVID-19, the children, uh, the, the newborns are less sick. Early onset COVID-19, the newborns are more sick. So there's something which I need you to understand. Right. So, okay. I would like to ask, how do you manage a COVID positive neonate? What is the management guidelines? Though this is entirely in the purview of the doctors who look after these children, I would like you to understand, I would like you to understand that, I would like you to understand that in asymptomatic newborns, we just observe the baby for 10 days, first three or four days in the hospital, like routine and then at home. So we observe them for 10 days. If by 10 days the baby is asymptomatic, it's unlikely that the baby has got the infection. In mildly symptomatic children, we treat symptomatically with, for fever and cough. And many of these children can be treated at home. There's no problem. We give a little paracetamol drops. We give a little antihistaminic drops, maybe some nasal drops and continue breastfeeding. There's no problem at all. There are two other categories of children who can fall sick moderately symptomatic and severely symptomatic. In both of them, as I had mentioned to you earlier, it is better to keep them in hospital for observation. All may not require NICU care. NICU care should be reserved for those moderate and severely symptomatic children who deteriorate and require active intervention. Many of these children, as I told you, even with moderate and severely symptomatic disease, many of these children require only observation and nothing further. So please understand, I would not want you to panic as far as this situation is concerned. Question number, so the, those are the seven questions for the neonates. Now, I'd like to quickly talk a little bit about guidelines for our healthcare staff. And that is frequently asked questions. How do you care for mothers with confirmed suspected COVID-19 and the newborns? And the answer is very simple. Mothers and newborns may room in according to hospital guidelines. Do not separate the two. Infants are to be bathed soon after birth to remove virus potentially present on the skin. Mother should maintain a reasonable distance from the infant. So what we do is we keep the baby in a bassinet or in a cot just outside the mother's bed and not on the mother's bed. And during hands-on care when she's breastfeeding, she must wear a mask, perform hand hygiene and wash the breast before giving it to the baby. Because most of the transmission of the virus occurs through the respiratory uh, passages and through the respiratory secretions. Healthcare workers should use gowns, gloves, N95 masks, and eye protection when providing care for well infants in the same room as the mother. And if non FA infected attenders or other family members are present during the birth or in hospitalization, they must also take all COVID appropriate precautions. Next, can the infant breastfeed? Yes, yes, yes. Three times. Breast, breastfeeds are the best choice of milk for infants in all situations. Mother should perform hand hygiene before breastfeeding. Wear a mask during breastfeeding to protect the infant from her respiratory secretions. Express breast milk feed should be discouraged as far as possible, owing to the increased risk of transmission through the mother's hand and through her secretions. But there may be situations when you have to express the breast milk, and that is if an infected mother chooses not to nurse her newborn, she may express breast milk after appropriate hand hygiene. And this may be fed to the infant by other uninfected caregivers taking adequate COVID appropriate measures. The second instance is if the mother of the NICU infants may express breast milk for the infants during any time that their infection status prevents them from entering the NICU. So many of these mothers who have the COVID-19, especially in our hospital, we don't allow them to come into the NICU because it's an unnecessarily taking a risk. During that time, we allow them to express the breast milk and we give it to them by means of a uh, non-infected attendant. So that is question number two. Question number three, should the well newborn or child of a COVID positive mother be tested for COVID? And this is a little tricky. Uh, testing a well -born, new well newborn will facilitate plans for care after hospital. If the child is negative, we send them home straight away. If the child is positive, we keep them under observation for a further 10 to 14 days. 
It will determine the need for ongoing precaution when use of PPE for care of the newborn by the attendants. See, if the infant is positive, the attendants have to take precautions. There's no doubt about it. But if he's negative, then the attendants can handle the baby as they do for all other babies, right? That includes for the children also. More importantly, it will relieve the anxiety of the family. So if it's available, it's better it is done. It is better it is done. And we usually do it after day three of birth, right? Next question. How do you follow up these infants who, who test positive on initial testing, right? And that is a follow-up testing at 48 to 72 hours interval should be done until two consecutive negative tests are, are obtained to establish that the infant has cleared the virus from its mucosal sites. If the infant has, still has the virus in the mucosal site, it is a potential danger to the caregiver. And this is very important for those infants who are cared for in the NICU. If they are if they're going home, there will be very few people who will come into contact with that newborn. Maybe mother, maybe one more attendant. But in the NICU, there is a potential that these babies may spread the infection to the other normal, non-infected babies, right? Caregivers should continue to use appropriate personal protective care until the unit infant has two consecutive negative tests. However, Government of India states that there is no need for retesting if the quarantine period is completed and the child is asymptomatic. So in older children, it may not be really required to, all it may be required is keep the child under isolation, keep the child in quarantine after 14 days or 17 days as per the guidelines. If the child is asymptomatic, let him go home or let him go out of the house without doing the testing. This is the Government of India. Okay. Right. Next question. What to do if the child requires an ICU operation, right? So if the baby requires an ICU, uh, ideally they should be isolated in a single room with a potential for air filtration, if available. If not available or if multiple COVID exposed infants are to be cared for together, there should be at least six feet between children and neonates, or they may be placed in a temp temperature controlled vicinity. You know, we have incubators. So many of these children, we just put them into incubators even though they don't require it, but because that incubator gives them a closed environment. And all precautions must be taken to look after these children, right? All precautions by the attenders. Please understand that, you know, especially the nurses who handle the ventilators, who handle the BiPAP, who handle CPAP, all of these are exposed to the aerosols. When air is coming under high pressure, it generates an aerosol and it disseminates the virus. These are the attenders, our nurses, our staff, our doctors, who require full PPE kit, require respirators, please do not uh, take any chances because the older you are, the more likely that the danger is uh, that the danger of COVID is more severe in, in that age group. If the infant is separated from an infected mother and directly admitted to the PICU, you know, how do you look up? Right. Infection control precautions appropriate to the child's required respiratory care is to be used until the child has tested negative at 42 to 72 hours of age. So take all precautions. You consider the baby as infected, born to an infected mother, and do the testing on, on between 48 and 72 hours. If it comes negative, then you treat the baby as any other problem. Okay. For the, for the newborn who is known to be dead and mother and subsequently, subsequently requires admission to the NICU, infection control precautions appropriate to the infant's respiratory care should be used until 14 days have passed since the last maternal infant contact. Testing on admission to the NICU at day seven and day 14 after the last maternal contact is recommended. See, these are some of the recommendations which are in the ideal situation. We cannot afford to do so many testing. So what we normally do is we test the baby on at uh, between 48 and 72 hours. If it comes positive, then those children are kept isolated for 14 days. If they become asymptomatic, we send them home without retesting. If the baby at 48 to 72 hours is negative in the testing, we just take the baby out of NICU and let the baby be handled as a normal. So there are some differences between our guidelines and the guidelines from which come from very developed uh, countries. When can the mother or father visit the newborn in the uh, infant or the child in the NICU? Today, most NICUs and PICUs are carefully screening parents and attenders. We do not allow them to come basically inside unless they have a, uh, they've been vaccinated or they have a COVID negative uh, test report. That is something which you need to enforce. 
especially for people coming from outside. If there's an inborn baby where you have a chance, uh, you may be a little more uh, secure. But if it's an outborn baby, you need to be very, very careful. Unvaccinated mothers, attenders, or those under investigation for COVID-19 should not enter the NICU. Confirmed COVID-19 positive mothers and attendants should not visit the NICU. Vaccinated parents can enter the NICU, PICU, and care for their children. So they need to be fully vaccinated with at least two doses, right? Not just one vaccine. Please ensure and ask for the final vaccination certificate. Right. When does the mother become non-infectious? When she has been afibril for 24 hours without the use of pyrethrin, antipyrethrins, and at least 10 days have passed since her symptoms first appeared, or at least 10 days have passed since her positive RT-PCR test. These are this is the important guidelines. Government of India says wait for 14 days, right? From the time that she became asymptomatic. So 14 days she becomes okay and she's asymptomatic on day 14, she can be treated as anybody else. Other caregivers have to use mask and hand hygiene before and after contact with the infant until their status is resolved. Government of India, as I told you earlier, states 10 days strict home quarantine plus seven days, uh, sorry, strict home isolation and seven days of home quarantine. So total of 17 days for most people who have COVID disease. So why not assess infectivity with a negative RT-PCR? Why don't we do it at the time of discharge? Because there have been a lot of cases which have and reports which have come out which state that even if the patient is asymptomatic and he is un incapable of sending the of spreading the virus to other people, yet when you do the RT PCR, you will find remnants of the of the nucleus of the of the virus on day 10, day 12, day 11, day 12, and then the report comes positive, and then the the and the isolation is continued for further period. Please understand: once a patient becomes asymptomatic and has crossed generally 14 days of isolation. Whether the RT-PCR comes positive or negative, there is a lot of controversy going on about this. And government of India says there's no need to test at all at the end of Right. So, well, to conclude my talk, there's a few take home points which I want to tell you. And before I start this slide, this last slide, I need to tell all parents, please do not panic. This is not a panic situation. When there is a panic situation, we doctors will tell you when to panic. But till then, please do. PICU and ICU care. So please don't panic. Don't panic and rush the child to the hospital. And you know, um, more serious children will require admission. Not the child who's asymptomatic. Next, mother to baby intrauterine transmission of COVID-19 can occur, but this is not yet an indication for MTP. Risk benefit analysis presently does not warrant separation of baby from mother at any time. Vaccinated mothers can certainly attend to their children and breastfeeding must continue, especially in low and middle income countries where breastfeeds are probably the only thing which is going to save these babies. Every necessary COVID precaution and appropriate behavior should be observed by the mothers, all in the nursery, the NICU staff, the PICU staff, and all handlers. Finally, and this is something which I need to explain to you. Finally, these recommendations may change tomorrow because data is still coming in and we will be changing these guidelines every three months or so. Thank you very much. This is a photo of the snow leopard, which I took when I was in Ladakh. And as elusive as the answers to the COVID-19. Thank you very much. I have finished. If there are any questions, I will be happy to answer. Wonderful question answer. Uh, thank you, Doctor, uh, for compressed presentation. Yet, with eliminating us with uh, almost all our clarifications, our doubts, and questions, and and uh, with limited remaining minutes, sir, uh, uh, we have almost uh, like uh, we are almost crossing every delegate's questions, and it is uh, 
sir has almost solved the answer. Now we have a uh, last three questions, sir. And the first one is from Dr. Mary Elizabeth Pinto. This is a rumor. Two years after people who had vaccination, death rate is high due to vaccine. What is your opinion on this? Uh, can um, you uh, please, uh, Dr. Ajit, can you please repeat the question? I'm not able to hear very well. Uh, uh, there's a, a question from Dr. Mary Elizabeth Pinto. Okay. There is a rumor two years after people who had vaccinated, death rate is high due to vaccine. What is your opinion on this? <laughs> no, um, uh, that is again a myth. Uh, we have not yet reached two years after the first vaccination. The vaccination actually started around February of 2021. We were the first persons to take the vaccines as doctors. We, I took my first shot on 16th of February and the second shot on the 18th of uh, March. And uh, well, <laughs> nobody can tell you whether after two years somebody is going to die or not. And if that is going to happen, uh, Dr. Elizabeth, I'm going to die first. So don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, sir. Okay, sir. Sir, uh, I am Sonam, and I have another one. Uh, second, last second question. Yes. yes. Uh, is there is there any scientific research of uh, uh, long term side effect of COVID? Uh, is there any scientific research regarding long term effect of uh, COVID, and will it affect genetically for younger generations? This, this, this is, is a, this is an excellent question. Thank you for asking this. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> At this stage, all I can say is that data has been coming in only for the last 18 months. Long-term effect, what is called as long COVID, is definitely known in adults. Um, this can include an affectation of almost every organ, most of which is in the brain or the heart or the kidney or the liver. These seem to be the four organs which are affected most Long COVID does occur. It is a it is a problematic illness. People are unable to go back to work. And it has been noticed in those people in whom the innate immunity was compromised at that stage. As I uh, tell you, we still don't have data about children regarding long COVID. But it seems likely that those children who have comorbidities like you know, diseases of these four organs or immune uh, system uh, suppression or asthma, obesity, these children may be prone to long COVID symptoms. We still are awaiting data on this. That is all I need to say. But most of this data, most of this data has come from Western countries, and we haven't received many data from India and the Asian and the Indian subcontinent. So that way, I think we may be saved from this. The, the number of cases of long COVID in India is significantly less than what we're getting from uh, the West. So take heart and we'll get back to you after one year and you know collate the data and come back with this data. But this is an excellent question and you, all of you need to keep this in mind. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir this is our last and final question. Yes. Uh, this is from my side. I'm, uh, uh, this is our last question. So with regard to education system in India, especially in India particularly, because, uh, because of this COVID uh, situation, there's a lockdown and almost all the institutions have been closed like uh, for under 18 years old, for especially children. Now, if like, is there any optional strategies to improve our education system, which is collaborated with this uh, disaster? Uh, how to live with this uh, COVID-19? How to improve our education system in educational aspects? Uh, can you Talk about this, sir. Ajit, you need to just tell me again. Uh, I, I could not follow you very clearly. Please tell me again. Okay, sir. Uh, okay, sir. I'm Sonam, sir. Uh, huh, sorry, Sonam. Huh. Uh, tell me, Sonam. Sir, I, uh, I want to talk about this Indian education, uh, 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 particularly about Indian education system, about education aspect. Because this COVID has affected almost all schools and colleges. Yes, I totally agree with you. And, and uh, sir, sir, I want to ask you, sir, as, uh, is there any optional strategies to improve our educational system uh, to live or to collaborate with this COVID, sir? How to collaborate uh, with COVID-19, sir? Is there any optional uh, strategies 
any optional strategies to how to improve the system education system or how to live with this covid situation how to study how to learn with this covid situation sonam yes, i wish I, i wish i could give you the answer to this uh, sonam because it has affected every single branch of education in our mbbs students they had a one year holiday they did not see a single patient other than covid the youngsters were put into the wards and asked to work they worked whole heartedly but the the education is they know everything about covid but i i i don't know how much they know about other diseases you see so it's a question that we need to teach them now in internship when they come to internship after passing the exam we are trying to teach them about the other diseases you understand so this is something which your teachers have to make an extra effort they have to make an extra effort to get you back on road this covid 19 is not going to last for very long at the most we will have another couple of minor waves and it will finish by 2023 or 24 at the at the latest in the process four years of your lives have been lost and i can well understand the anguish which the youngsters are undergoing because if four years of my life was lost when i was doing my mbbs i would know nothing you understand so, so the, at this stage you both of you have to work together the student has to work very very hard to come back to the normal and the teachers have to work very hard to bring them back on track this is something which is a, a national interest if you if you turn out a four year batch of doctors or engineers or someone who who are not capable of handling the situation later on in life then it is a national waste it's a waste and all of us should make efforts to get these children back on board i i am totally with you sunam this is something which needs to be addressed urgently and quickly otherwise it is going to cause more of more of uh, delay and you know despair among the kids i i fully agree with you thank you for asking this question and i need this to be understood by all the others who are listening to this uh, uh, to this uh, webinar that this is of vital national interest teachers have to work harder the students have to work hard and we try to get over this four year period come back to some semblance of uh, you know normal life Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, with the end of our session. Thank you, uh, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. And, and, I, I, and I wish to thank the Mangala Foundation for having given me this opportunity to uh, express my views. I hope this has been uh, educative enough, and I'd be glad to answer any questions later on also if you have regarding this problem. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Okay, sir. Uh, we are extremely contented uh, by your illuminating and enlightening uh, sessions with lesson. uh we thank you uh, heartily for your bountiful and priceless information and consideration sir thank uh, you and now uh with the end of our first session uh, i invite uh, ms uh, lonita fernandez uh, to proceed for next uh, session and over to you lonita fernandez uh, thank you sir Thank you, Sonam. I, Ronita Fernandez, welcome you all to the second session of National Webinar. The topic for second session is Ameliorate Nursing Competencies to Meet Nursing Emergencies. Today, we have the second resource person, Dr. Yashoda Satish, Assistant Professor, Senior Care, Department of Child Health Nursing, Manipal College of Nursing, Mahi. She has completed her general nursing and midwifery. post certificate bsc nursing and has completed her masters at manipal college of nursing she has done phd under manipal manipal mahe on the title effectiveness of developmental supportive care on growth and development of preterm infants her work of experience is tremendous in both clinical and teaching fields that is for 
three years in neonatal intensive care unit at Kasturba Hospital, Manipal, and 15 years in various positions such as assistant lecturer, lecturer, and assistant professor. She has attended and has presented various research articles in both national and international conferences. Also, she has been the research person for more than 10 seminars and workshops. She has published more than 14 national and international journal articles. She has been certified with Breastfeeding Promotion Network of India and Young Child Feeding Specialist. She has published many articles in Udravani Health Magazine, such as Freedom Care, Breastfeeding, Kangaroo Care, Breastfeeding During COVID-19, Breastfeeding by Life and Responsibility. She has been the co-author and has written chapters in textbook of pediatric critical care nursing. Her achievements and awards are Best Poster Award during Carniacon Conference at Bangalore, titled Role of Developmental Supportive Care in Stress Level and Behavioral Organization of Treatment Infant Born, Less Than 32 Weeks of Gestation. Best article published in Scopus Index Journal titled Clinical Outcomes of Nagala Position Using Positioning Aids of Freedom Infants. Best article published in Scopus Index Journal titled Promote Developmental Supportive Care in Freedom Infants and Families in a Level 2 New Digital Intensive Care Unit in India. She has received grants from Maternal and Child Venture by Philip. Electronic India Limited for developmental supportive care positioning aids. We are extremely honored to have you, ma'am. Now the now the session is over to you, ma'am. Ma'am? Dr. Ashoda, ma'am, can you hear? Ashoda, ma'am, please unmute your audio and speak. Ashoda, ma'am, please unmute your audio.
Am I audible now? Ma'am, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you for the, your uh, very good uh, uh, the introduction what you have given, uh, and also I thank at the outside for the organizers for the opportunity. I'm really excited to talk with uh, my dear students as well as my other participants. Uh, let's today talk. Exactly, the topic given to me is ameliorate nursing competencies to meet nursing emergencies. Okay, the content I am going to de deliver today: introduction, core response to a pediatric nurse. Triaging and deciding level of care in children. This already Sarah has been mentioned. I'm not going to go in detail. And uh, Indian Academy of Pediatrics and Advanced Life Support update on resuscitation guidelines. Uh, and also 10 recommendations given for CPR. Okay, that uh, what uh, is supposed to do, I'm going to discuss. And management of acute respiratory disease syndrome and shock. And infection prevention control in uh, guidelines given uh, by uh, WH. These are the things I'm going to discuss today. Coming to the introduction, now we uh, really, we are in a very uh, pathetic stage. Some of the things already, the third wave is going to come. Uh, we don't know, it is maybe high burden for population. As Sir is was talking, I'm really, uh, it is uh, thinking that we are uh, safer when we are, we are uh, talking, isn't it? Uh, but still we are uh, in the, uh, we have to prepare any future sudden surge of COVID. Okay, for that, exactly, we have to augment existing health facilities for children, particularly in ICU and HDU facilities, as well as in the community setting. Okay, among adults, if you see around 80%, uh, whoever is infected, around 80% are having mild illness and 14 to 15% are having moderate and as well as 5% are having critical illness. Okay, even children are susceptible for infection, but as Sir has mentioned, only 0.3% are affected at present. And out of that, around 5% children require definitely a hospitalization. Okay, the, uh, some of the uh, causes including who are more susceptible for infection are malnutrition, HIV infection, under cardiac, liver and uh, uh, kidney ailment, any impairment and also cancer, chemo uh, cancer chemotherapy as well as immunodeficiency. Children would have this uh, problem. Managing COVID-19 pediatric can be highly complex and it is uh, surrounded by uncertainty of situation. Okay, ability to demonstrate nursing care competency and modern healthcare is arena is becoming increasingly important. We as the nurses, as Sir has mentioned, the nurses and nursing teachers and nursing students, definitely they have to make sure, update their knowledge and they should provide better care uh, when we are thinking of this. Safety is one of the most important concern and also competency document can also use to structural, uh, uh, structural professional development. Whatever things are there, we have can prepare, uh, follow the uh, protocol and documentation is once again important. Okay, And we have to make sure that uh, uh, the level of practical, uh, uh, the practical, uh, this clinical practice and competency, and uh, this is our most responsibility thing. Coming to the core responsibility of nurse in pediatric emergency care, what are some of the core re responsibilities before we are dealing with, we can see here. Okay, there are nearly core 12 core competencies are there. That should be your keep in mind when you are taking care of the COVID uh, pediatric patient. First one is provide promote adequate skill and knowledge in emergency department, skill staff, uh, cl uh, clinical staff, in the emergency care as well as resuscitation. Whoever working in the pediatric in it, they should know in and, about, uh, in and out about uh, emergency care and also how to resuscitate the child. Okay, second important thing is uh, serve as a resource for emergency department. Okay, any question arise, you should be able related patient care, you should be um, um, make sure that we are uh, solving that problem or we are uh, facing that uh, problem. 
the third important thing is established educational programs or training for staff like example how today you are uh, conducting this or uh, are organizing this uh, webinar you see how much it is helpful like that students are supposed to participate most of this uh, uh, wherever uh, possible they got opportunity they have to attend and they have to gain their knowledge as a, and not only that whenever you get practical experience you should not think uh, second okay uh, like example sometimes uh, unnecessarily we are skipping uh, try to skip from the clinical isn't it as sarah mentioned we have to update our knowledge as well as our competence and the improvements you have to work in the clinical okay uh, you have to try more as much as possible wherever possible you get training thing you have to attend that and uh, wherever you get clinical opportunity you have to work instead of simply standing or simply uh, passing the time okay next create pedi uh, pediatric quality improvement and uh, patient improvement initiative in our, in our level whatever possible things can be done in new if you feel that something can be done uh, new okay you try to implement that one not simply uh, simply keeping in your mind focus on pediatric safety this is one of the most important thing review and if in, in needed and improve equipment supplies and medication related to the patient care okay as much as possible in our level definitely nurse has got major responsibility in uh, reviewing some of the things okay if like a, uh, equipments are required or supplies and medications are required you have to think of and you can review those things next thing is establish pediatric injury and illness prevention initiative initiatives collaboratively work with uh, the other nursing team, uh, team to improve the care serve as a liaison or appropriate in hospital as well as out, out, out of the hospital interact collaboratively with the emergency medical system personnel and enhance pediatric care and create or improve the uh, hospital pediatric disaster preparedness to okay, be the point of communication with the uh, emergency med uh, medicine section okay this is actually collaborative care on the uh, patient and family centered care here we can collaborate uh, collaborate and communicate communication is the one the important thing and collaboration with other teamwork advocacy and technology and informatics and then also uh, professional development uh, safety safety and quality and research and evidence based care and also we have to uh, evaluate the outcome what is happening that we are we have to evaluate at the end now coming to the when we are thinking of uh, pediatric uh, uh, population the infections are less why it is less if you see this okay the uh, you can see different black flag area isn't it one of the most thing is why pre pediatric uh, population is having lesser infection or lesser prone uh, to get infection why it is uh, not seen first thing is their lung is very uh, normal comparing that adult and their less uh, exposure to their lungs are less exposed to uh, smoke as well as pollution that's a major reason second one is uh there if you see the ac inhibitor that ac inhibitor uh, if you observe what will happen here that is uh, mainly the receptors who are very entering to the cell is minimal as a result the minimal minimal lung injury third thing is what is happening is immune response okay immune response here t lymphocytes are very active and that is one of the reason they are lesser infection and also there is if you see the fetal hemoglobin okay here there is beta uh, thing is uh, missing and fetal hemoglobin alpha and gamma is there this is once again uh, better uh, susceptible for infection okay these are some of the area where we can see the children are comparing adult they are uh, better uh, uh, so even there some babies may, children may have infection but uh, they are susceptible for infection but they are more than carrier than they are having infection in their body okay and this also sir has been mentioned when we are seeing the guidelines of the uh, uh, covid 19 children you can see here we have classified as, uh, as asymptomatic mild moderate and severe if you see the asymptomatic here you can see uh, respiratory uh, rate per minute if you see it is normal in rate it depends upon the age if you see the mild condition it will be uh, once again uh, depends upon the child uh, there may be uh, it is normal but uh, uh, we have to see we should know first what is the normal and what is abnormal when you see the um, uh, moderate condition the, if the child is less than 2 months uh, the heart rate respiratory rate is more than 60 we will consider as moderate 
and uh, if the ba- child is between 2 months to 12 months the uh, respiratory rate is more than 50 and if the child is between 1 to 5 and 40 and if the child is more than 5 years the respiratory rate is uh, more than 30 some coming under moderate okay then when it is severe the respiratory rate is uh, respiratory rate uh, breath rate is usually it is rapid when you are comparing other and children if the baby is uh, between uh, 0 to 2 months it is more than 60 per minute 2 to 12 months more than 50 per minute 1 to 5 years more than 40 per minute and if the child is more than 5 years the uh, respiratory rate is more than 30 per minute coming to the oxygen saturation it, uh, it is more than 94% it is coming under asymptomatic if more uh, once again uh, mild also same uh, number and in case of moderate it is less than 90% uh, uh, 90 to 94% uh, that is once again coming under moderate if it in case of severe it is less than 90% for you to re- for you to remember saturation is above 94 it is uh, uh, in the mild and uh, asymptomatic moderate it is uh, more than 90 and between 90 to 94 and in case of severe it is less than 90 you should remember okay now coming to the grunting and uh, severe retraction there is no retraction uh, or grunting in asymptomatic and in the mild cases in case of moderate it is also not there in case of severe it is may be present or may not be present coming to the lethargy and somnolence it is not present in mild asymptomatic mild as well as moderate but it may be present in the severe okay this is how we are classifying now coming to the triage okay first you should know how we can triage mm-hmm. the children okay in this we are making one and two triage children seeking care at facility should be triaged appropriately with the assessment of severe illness okay it is as i mentioned two stages first one when we are entering the child you must have observed in your hospital also wherever you enter in the entrance there will be screening facility and after that they will go to emergency room isn't it at the holding area before entering into the isolation ward or rooms it consists of both screening plus detailed evaluation where in patient can be monitored before being wheeled into the specific hospital isolation wards okay now we can see the triage exactly what is happening in triage one just at the entry gate train personnel with the recommended pv ppe to screen the patient uh, and recording temperature and spo2 this has been taken place everywhere isn't it take the history of the patient if they have come in i will show you one uh, how to collect the history just uh, i'll just show the uh, chart uh, Uh, with the covid-19 patient or if they are uh, having any symptoms if the child test uh, negative for covid-19 they are provided with the covid-19 essential services because they have got some symptoms but uh, they are uh, uh, they are not positive uh, they are uh, negative okay attendants and patients are below, below 5 years of age should wear mask uh, and uh, mm, also make sure that they are following the hand hygiene and distance should be maintained more than 1 meter coming to the triage 2 okay triage 2 actually cohorting patient is done based on the clinical observation moderate cases are shifted to yellow or orange area okay then covid uh, and it is uh, if it is testing has been not done we have to go for testing if covid positive positive ch- uh, child whether moderate se- or severe symptom they will be admitted to the uh, dedicated covid health center or dedicated uh, coming to health center in for advanced care for patients who are having severe symptoms and requiring immediate life saving measures are provided with ventilator support access to oxygen support okay after immediate some stabilization emergency okay i will discuss how we have to do it in, in as much in brief they can shift it into icu mild patients care at home isolation ward or uh, quarantine facility but you have to give proper instruction for parent parents is, uh, are allowed here at least one person so oh, this is the physical triage checklist okay here demographic data is there okay symptoms related you have to tick then uh, the, also we have to whether the patient uh, rt pcr reports are supposed to be written then list of any current medication is there you have to write and also you have to write physical examination findings now this is the uh, iap and uh, indian academy of pediatrics and advanced life support update this is uh, given in 2001 latest one i have brought here Mm, uh, this chart, uh, this chart, uh, uh, just you can see here. Wh- whatever CPR we are doing uh, in uh, what you have learnt in your uh, uh, syllabus, along with that, what we are supposed to do here? First, we have to verify uh, the scene safety 
uh, protects yourself. Okay, you have to make sure that when you are uh, uh, handling the patient, you have to make sure that you are in safety. Okay, you have to follow all the precautions, and also you have to. Oh, assess the risk for COVID-19 transmission. Okay, and also you have to as much as possible when you are uh, uh, limit the team uh, composition. Okay, when you are uh, uh, when you are responding the uh, patient, whether you are checking the unresponsive or responsive, active activating the the CRS and use mobile device. When that time, you have to make sure that as much as possible limit team composition. Okay, it was not all are coming and uh, getting together like other patient. You are as much as possible limit member should be there when you are assessing for uh, uh, responsiveness. Uh, and uh, other uh, parameter you have to see that whether the patient uh, 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 child is having normal breathing or abnormal breathing okay if the normal breathing and uh, the patient has pulse uh, patient is going for recovery position and uh, continuing monitoring okay and if the patient is once again not normal but breathing has uh, uh, he has uh, no breathing but he has a uh, uh, pulse we are securing the airway and providing rescue breathing and start chest compression uh, less than uh, if the uh, pulse is less than 60 we are using relevant antidote whatever is required for the uh, patient okay next to what you are doing next step is once again uh, when you are doing high quality cpr you have to uh, 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 see this one red area whatever is there compression only for cpr with the airway airway shield and also secure airway and uh, use your uh, viral filter or uh, bag bag and mask uh, ventilation with the viral filter and uh, tight seal should be there. That is a one more consideration when you are doing uh, the resuscitation. And also we have to check for rhythm and based on that we have to go for whether sh shock cable or not. After that once again you have to give for shock, uh, uh, give shock or uh, no shock. Okay, if it is uh, when you are giving shock you have to make sure that resuming CPR immediately without pulse. We can make uh, also resuming immediately for the two minutes. Please mute yourself. Somebody is making noise here. And also, we should have the uh, checklist of this equipment. Okay, make sure that this many check uh, equipment should be there with you. That is nasal pharyngeal airway, N95 mask. Okay, uh, we, should, we should also use Google uh, uh, goggles here when you are doing the resuscitation. N95 mask and flash gun uh, or apron you are supposed to use. Double gloves you are supposed to use. Plastic uh, rubber uh, footwear you are supposed to use. Protect items from. Uh, somebody is talking. Uh, okay, protective items in addition to standard list that is face ma face shield, uh, surgical mask uh, for victim, and also we have to use aerosol um, uh, plastic box uh, uh, to dry, uh, keep the medication. Medication include once again adrenaline. Ad 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 uh, we have to use adrenaline, adenosine, uh, amiodarone, atropine, magnesium sulfate, lidocaine, midazolam, and saline plus should be kept ready. And also, we should along with this, we should have CPR board ready. We, uh, for intubation, we should have a video laryngoscope, stillet for our lunge launch should, should, should have. Then also, we have to appropriate size the endotracheal tube depends upon the child uh, age and uh, weight. Two ml series supposed to be kept for uh, keeping the uh, ETT cup. Usually, we will use a cup uh, ETT for the children uh, because especially in COVID cases, and we should have to um, uh, this uh, viral filter HME. Uh, for with the viral filter and bag and uh, bag wallet uh, uh, wallet device self inflating uh, 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 tube uh, self inflating bag we supposed to have closed the circuit system you have to have and also we have to have AED defibrillator and uh, we should have different size of cuff and the intro or needle supposed to have if the baby child is not getting IV line adhesive plaster syringes stethoscope, pulse oximeter, BP apparatus, and also we, sh we should have ET, uh, CO2 monitor and uh, surgical govern we supposed to have. These are the equipment we supposed to keep in this is listed guy given by once again uh, WHO standards. Okay. Now coming to the some of the recommendation, important recommendation when you are uh, uh, doing compression. Okay. We have to always follow PCAB. PCAB means nothing but we have to use uh, PPE. Okay, this is uh, in the COVID. One thing is important thing is uh, uh, we are using PPE. Then we are going for compression and airway. Then breathing the sequence we are going. Okay, in non-COVID critical area, the healthcare worker should preferably use uh, uh, use full of uh, PPE. You, even though it is not there, make sure that you, uh, this we are separating non-COVID and COVID area. There, you, the PPE should be there. Next thing is uh, shield among uh, patient's mouth and nose with aerosol box or plastic uh, uh, drape. Or uh, use surgical mask before starting chest compression if uh, airway is not uh, secured. Then do not 
give mouth to mouth or uh, mouth to uh, mask uh, ventilation which is that should be once again taken care you, see, you can see here yeah the box has been kept for that reason okay as much as possible you should be uh, 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 prevent that one use compression only cpr until the victim is already is, uh, is secured then cpr is highly aerosol generating procedure through spread of aerosol can be limited by use of shields or airway of the next victim that's the important thing we have to think of here next is, next area is the securing uh, the patient's airway second area is emergency thing so securing the patient's airway secure the airway using tracheal tube or laryngeal mask can be used minimize the exposure to risk of healthcare workers to connect viral filter or a heat moisturizer can be used then also you can use laryngeal mask along with that and also you can uh, make sure that we are using the self inflating bag intubation or insertion of uh, uh, when you are using uh, uh, this one laryngeal uh, uh, this thing is delayed means what you supposed to do use bag and mask ventilation with the filter okay what will happen sometimes when you are going for laryngeal intubation it may be sometime it will delay for that time you can use viral filter as well as side seal okay this all preventing yourself next third one is the restrictive team composition okay here three members should be there one for airway second one for compress uh, com the pro providing compression and third one is for uh, if it required uh, a uh, defibrillation okay other team mem member responsible for recording the events okay these some of the things you should keep in mind next is the tracheal tube placement okay when you are intubate uh, when you are providing int uh, intubating the patient use intubate laryngo uh, video laryngo scope or using the laryngo mask airway as i mentioned earlier use direct laryngo scope with the protective measures as mentioned okay then uh, stop chest compression while intubating or inserting the uh laryngeal mask airway cuffed tender tracheal, uh, tracheal tube are uh, preferred inflate the cuff Im uh, immediately on insertion attach viral filter as mentioned above confirm tracheal tube placement by the chest or uh, endotracheal uh, uh, co2 detector avoid auscultation use closed suction system okay this is regarding tracheal tube uh, placement for fifth one is attached to the ventilator early okay don't delay as much as possible when you are doing uh, 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 when you are uh, intubating your ventilator setting should be ready this is one more thing you should always not uh, running after that so uh, always in your unit always you supposed to keep one ventilator setting should be ready so that you are not it and running here and there okay uh, soon after uh, intubation you should be connect to the ventilator connect to a mechanical ventilator once it is airways in space huh? deliver the uh, uh, deliver in place huh? deliver chest compression at 100 at 100 to 120 per minute without force the breath by ventilator rate at a rate of 10 to 20 uh, per minute uh, 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 per minute in adults and adolescent we can give 12 to 20 per minute uh, and also we can give so you can see 10 to 12 per adolescent or adults and 10 to 12 to 20 per uh, children okay as possible some of the unit may have mechanical uh, device that they can use for even cpr okay this is a aed uh, and defibrillator uh, we are following the if the ch uh, child has got cardiac arrest here also once again they have given specific in, uh, instruction use only aed uh, pads instead of defibrillator paddles to deliver the shock uh, minimize contact with the patient and in children with the dose attenuated uh, aed is preferred and pads may be applied anterior posture position uh, in prone ventilated uh, requires cpm Uh, CPR and also AED is not available. Use defibrillator pads, uh, taking infection, uh, infection and prevention and control precautions. Okay, this is to keep in mind. Next is the CPR in prone position. Okay, when you are performing CPR in prone position, in patient already receiving prone ventilation, position hand just below the subcapillar uh, line over T uh, to T uh, seven to T uh, ten vertebrae. on the mid line this is the one thing you should remember when you are uh, providing a cpr deliver compression at the same rate 100 to 120 per minute and force the insufficient compress and one third of the anterior posterior diameter in the supine okay when you if they are putting a prone position that should be it is not much that all the baby should get prone position but uh, when you are doing most of the time uh, this should be followed next is the hypomagnesemia this is the one of the thing we should be corrected for uh, ventricular arrhythmia 
hydrochloroquine or azithromycin used predisposes in patient to the ventricular arrhythmiasis and also like a tort sedes or pontis. Okay, here consider magnesium sulfate infusion during the resuscitation. This is once again uh, recommended by Blochow. And also uh, early use of SOFU drugs, uh, that is one return of uh, WHO circula uh, uh, this, uh, uh, spontaneous circulation is assured, then you can consider early use of SOFU drugs okay, for shock, especially if the patient is in shock. Okay, avoid aggressive fluid resuscitation. Okay, when you are always make sure that um, patient is not over the uh, over fluid. Okay, when you are uh, keep eye on uh, this IU fluids. Okay, sometimes there is chance of getting full bottle is going within one hour or something. Okay, always you have to uh, uh, check that uh, the drip rate in between. Okay. Last one is uh, appropriateness of resuscitation and CPR uh, uh, duration. Okay, follow the hospital policy of CPR and patient transfer. In patients with advanced stage of disease and uh, those with the comorbidities, possible outcome may be considered while deciding continuation or termination of CPR. Risk certification should be discussed among healthcare workers and communicated parents or proxy. These uh, modifications are primarily targeted to ensure safety to healthcare worker without compromising the quality of CPR. Simulation and repeated team practice is highly recommended for acquiring this. Uh, uh, new psychomotor skills okay this cannot be done if you are like listening one uh, uh, lecture or listen or observing one okay this always this sense of is not uh, once or twice okay this should be practiced properly then only you'll get okay this competency is not that much easy practice may man the per man, man perfect okay this should be repeatedly then you have to first initially observe and you have to do yourself then only you can do okay this is not one uh, easy but uh, you have when you become competency you make sure that as much as possible simulation is re done repeatedly repeatedly if you done initially you can done with the simulation after that you only if you have once uh, once you are really competent then you do with the patient okay for that nursing students we are requesting you have to practice you have to practice you are sitting and studying in the home or avoiding clinical you won't get anything please uh, um, as much as possible spend time in the clinical whatever required is there and not only spending time in the clinical and be there with the patient you provide care then only you'll become competent nurse. otherwise you won't become you will be, be become bookish or other will become uselessness and you are not at all productive for the hospital you keep in mind okay now 10 recommendation for cpr okay protect yourself before starting chest compression as i mentioned earlier personal uh, protection is very important okay we have to follow the covid guidelines we have to personal protective equipment should be used then compression then uh, airway and breathing then uh, that's you can should go then secure the airway to minimize the exposure to risk exposure risk district team composition to triangle to educate uh, uh, a triangle of resuscitators uh, that's as i mentioned that should be three members should be there in the uh, different role practice additional care while placement of tracheal tube attach ventilator early preferably use aed if defibrillator is uh, pads are available and also use pads in placement of conventional pad okay consider hypomagnesemia CPR can be given with the prone with an advanced uh, airway in place. Early use of asoactive drug instead of uh, using uh, aggressive fluid resuscitation in the um, uh, uh, child, especially when it is uh, when you are going for uh, 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 this one. These are the ten points you have to keep in mind. This is I have already discussed with you when we are considering as mild, moderate, severe. Now we are uh, going to see the uh, especially in ICU. And if the patient is uh, become uh, has got CV uh, when he has got respiratory distress, what we supposed to do? Okay, and uh, also we, how we have to manage the shock. Okay, in brief, I am going to discuss. Please listen. Okay, management and treatment of ARDS. Okay, may be classified into uh, 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 pediatric acute lung injury consensus. Okay, or definition given by them. In their, in their, they have classified into mild, moderate, and severe. In mild high flow uh, uh, nasal cannula, we can start with the 0.5 ml per kg, begin with, and also we can increase to 2, uh, two liter per kg for uh, 2 liter per kg per minute with monitoring and non invasive ventilation by PEP or CPAP can be given. Okay, it is mild RDS. Okay, now next is the moderate severe RDS. 
Moderate severe RDS, we can go for lung protective mechanical ventilation may be used. Avoid frequent disconnection of uh, uh, ventilator circuit, nebulization or metered uh, dose inhaler or restrict the fluids calculate overload percentage keeping in less than 10%. Prone position may be considered hypoxic, uh, hypoxemia children if they are able to tolerate. Daily assessment of weaning and early extubation. Okay, when the patient is an oxygen not keeping oxygen, we are comfortable. We can keep a higher oxygen. Okay, we have early you wean the oxygen, the patient will uh, we can bring out oxygen fast. Okay, as much you have to check the oxygen saturation, you have to try to bring out the oxygen saturation and also enteral nutrition if required uh, for 24 hours. HU full feeds by 48 hours. Transfusion trigger that is if the build uh, is a hemoglobin less than. Uh, seven, uh, you have to go for uh, uh, this one, uh, transfusion, and also we have to maintain stable oxygenation and dynamics and uh, decrease refractory hypoxemia shock, which is our uh, objective here. Now, we, how we can manage shock, you can see here. Okay, you have seen I learned moderate severe uh, this thing. Now, how we can uh, 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 manage the, uh, uh, this one, what is that, the shock? Okay, if the patient with shock, what you can do? First, we have to go for crystalloid uh, bolus that is 10 to 20 ml okay consider crystal fluid bolus 10 to 20 ml per kg over 30 to 60 minutes with early vasoactive support we can go for even epinephrine can be given either in the patient what we will do usually we will go for in our hospital we will go 10 uh, 10 to 20 ml normal saline or ringer slacted it's preferably we will give okay after that what we will do we will still the patient is uh, not responding we will go for epinephrine Start antimicrobial within first hour. Okay, why? Because uh, there is, if you leave the child without antimicrobial, we'll do sepsis workup and we will go for antimicrobial. We'll start with the start, first generation antibiotic and we'll see the culture and uh, uh, report, then we will uh, change the, de de depends upon the sensitivity pattern, we'll change the antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Okay, then it depends upon your hospital, you can follow. Consider ionotrophs. Can anyone uh, write what are the what are some ionotrophs usually we are using in ICU? You just write in your uh, message. What is ionotrophs you are using in the hospital? Consider ionotrophs mentioned. Anyone can one of you can just write what are ionotrophs. Just write within one minute, not checking with this uh, net and writing. What is the ionotrophs? One drug you can write in the chat box. Any one of you. Within minute, not checking the net. One of you can just write what is ionotrophs used in the hospital. You are fourth year students, so you are organizing this. One of you write within one minute. Not checking in the net and writing. I didn't see anyone. One ionotrophs you can drag you can write in the chat box. No, no, no. This is a condition, you see. This is not only here, everywhere. This is a condition. It is even it should be tip of the tongue. One dinotroph drugs means you should be able to write now. No one is writing. No, anyone is listening or not this one? I am only talking. No one is listening also, I believe. One of you write, then only I will proceed. Okay. Very good. The pomin, the butamine, you can use the butamine. Very good. Who is this? Uh, Sinesa, Sineca uh, Sequera. Very good. Okay. Okay, uh, then I'm anyway. I'm going to discuss later what uh, the medication we are giving. Hydrocortisone may be added if there is fluid refractory catecholamine resistant shock. Okay, avoid as much as possible. Uh, avoid if already on a dexamethasone. But okay, when we are giving, we should be. I, I will talk about uh, this uh, drugs also a little bit. Uh, okay, when you have to give, what we have precautions you have to take. Once stabilized, restrict IV fluids to avoid our fluid overload. Initiate enteral nutrition soon. The sooner the better. Okay, why we are telling enteral nutrition? Uh, because new, as Sir also mentioned, nutrition is very, very essential for the patient, uh, for the children, isn't it? Uh, so to recover from the disease. For that, we have to start enteral nutrition as early as possible. But you have to see where before starting, the bowel movements are present or not, maybe as fast tool or not, at least you have to see, then you have to start. Because hypoxia stage, there may be chance of decreased perfusion to the gut. Uh, and maybe uh, paralytic ileus may be there. But when you are starting also, small amount of feed should be started and gradually it increase the feed. You have to see the further returns also. If it is more than 25% of return, we should uh, not should not grade up the feed. Okay, that you have to keep in mind. And transmission trigger, trigger, I have told, if there is a build, uh, uh, hemoglobin is less than uh, 7, we have to go for transmission.
okay now little bit about uh, multi system inflammatory syndrome in children okay so in the classification the patient has got what we supposed to do okay here what it is a new syndrome in characterized by uh, unremitting fever more than 28 degrees centigrade and epidemiological linkage with the sars cov2 uh, coronavirus v2 and diagnostic criteria we have to follow okay based on that only we have to do okay first most thing is a 0 to 18 years of age with a more fever more than 3 days and any one of the following then we will consider as mirs is positive okay rash or sir has mentioned this one sir has shown some pictures also isn't it rash or bilateral non purulent conjunctivitis or mucocutaneous inflammation signs okay it may be in the oral or in hands or feet okay this is one of the indicator hypotension or shock features of myocardial dysfunction or pericarditis alveolitis or coronary abnormalities it include echopinis or may, may be elevated troponin or uh, this uh, uh, pro uh, tro, uh, troponin level then also we can see here evidence of coagulopathy we have to see for the um, uh, this uh, 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 prothrombin time and also uh, elevated d dimers will be seen okay, and also acute gas uh, intestinal problems can be seen in this uh, cases okay if it is in, increased Uh, markers of inflammation such as increased uh, ESR more than 40, C-reactive protein is uh, C-reactive protein is more than 5 milligram per liter, or procalcitonin. Is procalcitonin also is one of the indicator of sepsis, and no other obvious microbial cause of inflammation, including bacterial sepsis, staphylococcal or streptococcal uh, shock syndrome. Okay, then and and evidence of re- recent COVID-19 infection that is RT-PCR positive. and also antigen test or serology test are positive or likely to contact with the covid 19 19 alternative diagnosis must be excluded before uh, uh, diagnosis of uh, this one okay we are whenever we are diagnosing we have to see that they have got any other, other underlying cause and also tropical fever like example malaria dengue scurf typhus and trick so other things also we have to see here and toxic uh, toxic shock syndrome okay staphylococcal or streptococcal bacterial sepsis once again uh, msps with the kawasaki uh, disorder this are some of the things you have to rule out then only that to come okay now i have mentioned your uh, steroids okay steroids when to give how much you have to give this to keep in mind steroids are not indicated or harmful in symptomatic and mild uh, cause of uh, cause case of uh, covid 19 and once again indicated only in the first class fever the critically covid uh, 19 cases okay steroid should be used at right time right dose and right duration okay this is the important thing and the indication and recommended dose of corticosteroid may be used in rapidly progressive moderate and all severe cases okay and dexamethasone 0.5 1.15 well, mg mg maximum dose can be given 6 mg once a day okay or we can also go for methylprednisolone 0.75 mg per kg maximum dose of 30 mg once a day okay continue for 5 to 7 days and taper the dose this is one thing important whenever we are giving any uh, corticosteroids uh, we should always should not abruptly stop when you are educating the parents also you are discharging with the uh, uh, prednisolone this is not only this case uh, maybe nephrotic syndrome other cases uh, we have to always taper we should not start abruptly stop okay and that is the one thing you have to keep in mind okay then depending on the clinical assessment daily basis you can uh, taper the dose a was serious first three to five days since onset of symptoms are uh, it prolong the viral shedding okay this one thing you should keep in mind uh, that's why we have to rule out all the things then only we have to start with the we have to when the others are not working then only we have to start for uh, the steroids okay self medication or steroid must be always uh, avoided okay we should not advise any child steroids and all or the, this should be prescribed by the physician keep it mind next one is anticoagulant okay one of the thing is uh, anti uh, steroids we have discussed usually used in the uh, sick cases especially severe cases uh, and second thing is uh, uh, anticoagulant okay it is not indicated routinely we should know when to start when should not be given okay all hospital children should have monitored for thrombosis on suspicion confirmed by appropriate uh, investigation and start only low molecular weight heparin uh, in therapeutic doses for period of 12 weeks with the monitoring predisposing risk factors for development of thrombosis personal history of venous thrombotic uh, uh, event and family history of pre uh, first degree relative uh, this um, uh, venous thrombosis event presence of uh, central venous line decrease morbidity 
from baseline burns, active malignancy, estrogen therapy, flare of inflammatory disease, uh, morbid uh, obesity, severe dehydration, and recent trauma or injury. These are some of the predisposing factors you should be keep in mind. A prophylactic anticoagulant is indicated in the following circumstances strong personal or family history, and uh, of uh, uh, what I mentioned earlier, an indwelling uh, central venous line, and uh, one or two or more additional risk factors for other more risk factors. Okay, they have to keep in mind. Next uh, thing is what you are saying that the decision to administer prophylactic anticoagulation must be balanced with child's bleeding risk. Children already on anticoagulation therapy may be continue same unless there is a uh, developed activity. Okay, we have to make sure that prophylactic dose 0.5 mg per kg twice daily till the child is discharged from hospital and therapy dose is usually 1 milligram per kg per dose. This is what you should remember. Prophylactic is 0.5 mg. Okay, when you started anticoagulant and uh, therapeutic dose is once again uh, point, uh, 0.1 mg per, uh, per kg twice a day. We should be remember these things. Okay. Uh, this is the one infection control. Uh, just I am uh, just I will uh, read out what are the infection controls should be used in uh, uh, in the hospital. Mainly standard precautions are uh, uh, we are uh, using standard precautions, droplet uh, droplet and airborne precautions and uh, contact uh, precautions and hand hygiene, physical distancing. These are the major things you have to remember. Along with that, you have to cough uh, this thing. Uh, you, as you know, this are, I think it's clear for you. I'm not going to, in detail, I'm going to tell. Guide for using masks also they have mentioned, and antibiotic, antimicrobial uh, use guide also they have mentioned here. Antimicrobial use guide, I'll just read out for you people. Asymptomatic and mild cases, we can use antimicrobial are not recommended for therapy uh, or uh, prophylaxis. Moderate and severe cases, you can use antimicrobial, should not be uh, prescribed unless there is a clinical suspicion or, or, uh, or super added uh, infection. Okay, and in case of septic shock, definitely you can use, use uh, empirical and antimicrobial according to the body weight and frequency added to the cover or likely to pathogens based on the clinical judgment and also patient cost factors and local epidemiology and antimicrobial policy of the hospital. This once again, as I mentioned, we will do usually sepsis workup and based on the sepsis workup, we will start on first time generation and we will move to the, uh, if required based on the sensitivity pattern, we will go for uh, our uh, uh, next uh, second generation antibiotics. We, these are some of the important uh, things we are doing in emergency. Well, anything anyone want to ask after that, I will continue for emergency. So far, whatever you have seen, anything you want to ask, any points? Or anything you have observed, anything you want to discuss? We have seen different area, anticoagulant you have seen, steroids you have seen. Okay, how we are classifying the multi-system uh, inflammatory syndrome, how we are seen. Anything, any, anywhere you want to ask any points, any questions. If you are asking question, if I know, I will answer, otherwise find out and I'll communication with the, uh, communicate with the madam. Anything, anyone want to ask so far. Classification, you are clear. Asymptomatic, mild, moderate, severe, you are clear. At least one of you can uh, write. You are clear about this, how we can classify the child. Common symptoms you can see here, fever, cough, rhinorrhea. Okay, that is coming under asymptomatic only. Okay, after that, that is a common flu like. Before, uh, next is in the mild to asymptomatic, you can see here, sore throat, th throat irritation, body ache, headache, malaise, weakness. And in the moderate to severe, you can see diarrhea, anorexia, vomiting, loss of sense, okay, so smell. This may be there, may not be there, okay, it's symptom. After they are classifying according to the respiratory rate, SPO2, grunting, okay, as, and severe detraction of chest and lethargy, somnolence. With this, we are classify once again, asymptomatic, mild, moderate, or severe, other than common symptoms, okay. Here, we, we should know first, one important thing you should know depends upon the child that is respiratory rate has been given. The child has got uh, uh, less than uh, two minutes. You should remember that it's, uh, the heart uh, respiratory rate is more than 60. Two to 12 months is a normal rate what we are talking. 
okay if it is more than that we will consider okay 2 to 12 months more than uh, it is less than 50 is supposed to be there 1 to 5 years it is, should be less than 40 is the uh, normal we are considering and uh, if it is a child is more than 5 years the less than 30 is the respirator that's the important thing you should know okay because respiratory this is affecting on mainly on the respiratory isn't in case of uh, severe you can see here okay there will be rapid respiration will be there along with the more than uh, uh, respiratory rate okay after that you can see the saturation okay when you are seeing saturation okay you should remember that in the symptomatic and the mind there will be more than 94 saturation this is important okay in case of moderate you can see the saturation comes in between 90 to 94 Okay, here they have mentioned above 90, isn't it? It is coming 90 to 94. In case of severe, the saturation is less than 90%. That you have to remember. Okay, this is the one thing you should remember. First one is the respiratory rate. Second one is the oxygen saturation. Third area is the grunting. If you see that when you are examining the chest of the baby, there will be severe grunting will be there. Okay, if you grunt, if you, uh, if you are not seeing children, you just uh, check in the net how the grunting and how the respiratory interaction takes place, okay. Based on that, we will see, in case of normal, uh, asymptomatic, mild and moderate, there won't be any, uh, uh, this grunting or uh, retraction, retraction of the chest. Eh? But in case of severe, this will be present or sometimes are not present also. Other symptoms may be there. Next one is the lethargy and somnolence. It's because of infection, the ch any child, when you, are, when you are looking the child, Okay, always you should, this only not only for COVID, I'm telling any other condition also. If the children, especially newborn baby, okay, so uh, in newborn baby period, or they are more prone to get the infection, isn't it? When the babies are not sucking, okay, not sucking well, babies lethargy, okay, these are two, two things always. Yesterday, when you are seeing the baby is very good, but today, babies are lethargy, okay, baby is not at all feeding. The first thing you have to consider either may be hypoglycemia or it may be sepsis okay this you have to keep in mind here also same thing it may be present or may not present this classification is very important for you other than that anything i want to discuss 10 recommendation this i have read out and also i told you when you are doing cpr we should remember these points okay protect yourself is important and secure the airway minimizing the exposure to risk okay what will happen one more thing i want to tell intubation time you will do hurry bari we will use all on sterile technique Okay, because of that, when you are later, when the patient enter into the ICU, there may be getting infection. Okay, that is why when you are the child enter or whoever patient enters, when you are doing resuscitation or when you are doing intubation or any other resuscitation sterile measure, please follow the standard precautions. Uh, this prevention, infection prevention protocol. If you follow properly, later no need to patient suffer in ICU or something. Okay. Whichever unit has been taken care well protected CPR, that child or that patient won't suffer in ICU. Most of the uh, patients are suffering in ICU because of your infection. You are not followed protocol, infection protocol. Please learn now itself and student period itself. Whatever teachers has been taught to you, please follow. Whatever the uh, how to uh, give injection, how to um, do some of the procedure, please follow that one. Please don't follow the what staff nurses are following or something. I'm not telling all the staff nurses are doing mistake but some hospitals may not uh, follow some of the uh, proper precautions okay i'm not telling them some of the their sisters are doing very wonderful things but some of the unit may not follow precautions that is why whatever we taught in your uh, uh, this thing the practical lab whatever taught please follow that i'm requesting you one thing okay so that we can prevent many infections okay district team for composition that i told already practice additional care placement of the endotracheal tube that i have discussed attach ventilator early okay one more thing i am uh, requesting all of you when you are learning learn something about in and about little bit about ventilator okay basic what is uh, what is acidosis what is alkalosis this you should be able to read your uh, abc first important thing because when the patient comes sick you should be able to identify okay whether it is acidosis or alkalosis how the patients look you should be you when you are becoming uh, uh, staff nurse or something you should be able to do something at that time then only you are useful resource uh, resourceful for the hospital or something okay for that reason you should be able to read the uh, abg and also you should be able to read the uh, 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 some of the basic ventilator thing you should be able to read okay
then uh, hypermagnesium told CPR should be given in the prone position. Then I told uh, early vasodilator. You should have some knowledge about all the drugs. Okay, drugs should uh, when you are working in this thing, basic no knowledge of the drugs should be there. And also consider uh, appropriate starting duration of CPR. CPR should be all all of you. I am requesting if you are not well versed to learn something, practice and do it. Okay. So things I want to tell. I think with this, uh, if any questions you can uh, post, now I will. Uh, I, if I am possible to answer, I will answer. Otherwise, some few uh, things I want to tell you uh, with this. First one is, uh, for the future, this also I have, uh, it is not my this, I have uh, uh, downloaded from uh, Ministry of Health for, they have mentioned here some of the things, several vaccines against uh, sars uh, cov are uh, uh, develop in development. However, it remains unclear when uh, successful vaccine might be. Uh, ruled out, especially in children. It is uh, still in uh, uh, this research stage. Uh, studies on factors responsible for immune dysregulation may be provide insight into the developing vaccine, capable of including uh, dura durable protective immunity and avoiding vaccine-related adverse events. Somebody has uh, had a question earlier also. Then uh, the unprecedented uh, pre precedented uh, pandemic should be prompt, improved global surveillance of infectious disease as well as cooperation and communication so that global so society remains in interconnectedness and li limits the spread of outbreak. That's the one thing you should remember. Uh, key messages for uh, uh, parents when you are giving this. Sir also uh, told some of the points. Just I will tell you whenever the parents come across you, they pay ask some question. Some of the uh, points here are there. There are no medicines or pills to prove and to prevent coronavirus infection in any person. Only recently, a few vaccines are available, which mainly protect against disease. At present, the vaccines are approved, used in adults only. The best way to protect children is to continue to follow COVID-19 appropriate behavior. Yes, Western countries, some of the things are, some of the vaccine has been started, but still this in a thing. But always maintain a physical distance away, uh, that is um, as much as possible, use going clinic, uh, medical, treatment or urgent supplies, okay, whenever you don't forget to whatever that uh, is supposed to be done, okay, wear mask when you are the outside the, uh, make sure that face mask that I am not going to tell, continuously wash hands with the soap water, 70% sanitizer, uh, making sure that whole surface of the hands are covered, get vaccinated, everyone should be eligible for eligible uh, above 80, 18 years, avoid attending public function and social gathering, avoid group play, and discuss, demonstrate, and reiterate importance of COVID-19 appropriate behavior in children. Okay, this something should be you tell for the parents. Sir has been nicely discussed. I think you have most of the things points you have got from sir. Uh, along with that, my take home message is nurses must be able to demonstrate accurate knowledge of physical and psychological development changes of children and age between 5 years and 18 years and they apply this knowledge to examination and treatment of COVID-19, mild, moderate and severe cases, providing good, uh, pro uh, providing good pediatric emergency care has become a high priority and it is hoped that practice standards will improve the line of the national survey. Okay, improving the health and welfare in children is important investment for the future. At this end, all healthcare professionals must strive to deliver high quality, timely, efficient pediatric COVID-19 care. With this, I will conclude my session. Anything is there, you can ask. Whatever I know, I will answer. Thank you, ma'am, for generously sharing the information with us. Now, let us move on to the question and answer session. Ma'am, I have a question from my side. Yeah. Uh, transport of child from a center to another hospital, are hmm. there any extra measures to be taken into consideration? Yeah, actually, uh, when you are transferring, definitely there is um, COVID guidelines is there. Okay, we are, whoever is, as I mentioned earlier, you have to protect yourself. Okay, whoever is the, attending the child, they should protect themselves. That is the first thing. And you have to assess the child first. Okay, how the child's condition is. Based on that, you have to, if the child, example, child, the distress is more. Okay, then you have to take precautions for that. Okay, whether any airway, airway patterns is good, how you have to position the patient. Okay, based on, that is the important. One is protecting yourself is important. Whether uh, ambulance, you have to call for stock. Uh, that COVID line, helpline is there. You have to call them. They will immediately reach you. 
okay that is important then and protecting yourself is important understood okay that's assessment is important once again here as in a, if you are uh, attending the test the second question from a student ma'am yeah are there any post covid sequels post covid there are chances okay definitely there are chances it's once again how well we are managed and not only managed as earlier earlier sir also mentioned post covid there is a recurrence of chances of infection is there that is why nutrition is important nutrition part is very important and preventing yourself once again whoever has take, uh, got infection they have they should not i got once i have got no this there is chance of uh, recurrence okay i have seen the case so that's why i am telling with my limited knowledge anything else at what rate of saturation the child requires ventilator support ma'am less than 90% as i mentioned they will go for definitely uh, once again they have to see other condition okay less than 90 we will close monitor closely monitor and will and we will see the apg not only saturation we will do the apg if there is acidosis respiratory acidosis there we will go for uh, uh, intubation the last question ma'am yeah how do we address the psychological aspect of parents of covid children admitted in hospital are they are they allowed to stay with the child yeah definitely one parent should be allowed okay but some of the hospitals still they are not allowing but it is uh, according to who and unicef people they have mentioned that one person should be there with the close uh, maybe mother or father they supposed to be there one person allowed in the uh, uh, children care okay otherwise we are not allowing but children supposed to be one parent should be there understood now we are at the end of the session i thank dr yashoda satish for share sharing your knowledge with us The session was really informative. Now I invite Mr. Sujit to deliver validatory report. Thank you. before that i just to thank okay before that i just to thank this uh, mangala group trust as well as dean uh, principal and faculty and fourth year students who over us uh, given me opportunity i am really thanks once again i did not mention okay respected delegates principal and my dear friends good afternoon everyone i mr sujit des organizing secretary will be sharing the highlights of today's webinar we kicked off the day by registering 500 plus delegates we inaugurated the webinar on 15th september 2021 at 10 am dr mari ipinto principal new mangala college of nursing welcomed the resource person and delegate with delighted words followed by inaugural address first session was moderated by mr sonam tokpen who introduced the first resource person of the webinar dr kanal etike rao pediatric hematologist oncologist professor and head department of pediatrics in bangalore he stressed on the topic parental concern and management guidelines the session was informative and educative i'm sure every parent might have enriched the knowledge on how to care their young ones during this pandemic followed by first session second session was moderated by ms donita fernandez and she introduced dr esoda satish professor senior skill department of child health nursing mahe manipal she stressed on the topic ameliorate nursing competencies to meet nursing emergency the session was informative and educative it was a successful webinar as feedback from the delegate was rated excellent now i invite ms deepa to deliver vote of thanks
me that nobody can take it away from you. Good afternoon, respected speakers, principal, teacher, delegates, and my dear batchmates. It's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks and acknowledge the contribution of those who worked really hard to make this webinar successful. I take immense pleasure in extending my sincere thanks to our beloved chairman, Dr. Ganapati P. and Vice Chairman, Dr. Anita Jibhat, for your support. I devote my sincere thanks to the Secretary of Mangala Charitable Trust, Mr. Rajesh Malli, for his enormous cooperation in organizing this event. I have no word of gratitude towards the two eminent personalities without whom this program has no value. They are the today's speaker, Dr. Kanal Etike Rao, pediatric hematologist, oncologist, and senior professor, and HOD in pediatrics in Bangalore, and Yasoda Sachin, senior care, Department of Child Health Nursing, Manipal. I would also like to thank Mrs. Pratishna Suhasini, Dean and Principal of Mangala College of Educational Institution. I also extend my sincere thanks to the principals and vice principals of Mangala Group of Educational Institutions for their continuous guidance and support, which stimulate us to do our best. A big thanks to a great supporter, Mr. Vijay Kumar, PRO, for your guidance and support. I thank opportunity to take all the delegates, teaching and non-teaching staff for your cooperation and support. I would also like to thank the technical team and all the people who work behind the screen to make this event happen. Last but not least, I wish to express my gratitude and thanks to all my guests who work closely to make the webinar successful.